we're going to do a quick opening exercise. My name is Casey Foster. I'm the coordinator with the Urban Youth Collaborative. We're a coalition of youth-led groups uh, from New York City. I'm going to ask all of our participants in the center to please just read what it says on your card at loud so everyone in the room can hear. White girl. Asian boy. Black boy. White boy. Latina girl. OK. Some of the statistics that we are going to share in the Step Forward exercise are going to be uh, locally for folks that live in New York City, and some of them will be national statistics. If you're caught, oh, sorry, in New York City, there are over 840,000 children living in poverty. If your card says white, take one step forward. In New York City, nearly 20% of Asian children live in poverty. If your card says Asian, take two steps forward. If your card says Latino or black, take three steps forward. Approximately one third of Latino and black children in New York City live in poverty. In preschool, black students represent 18% of the preschool population in the nation but account for 36% of all preschool students that are suspended multiple times during a year. If your card says black, please take two steps forward. Black students are four times more likely to be suspended than white students. Black girls are 10 times more likely to be disciplined than their white peers. Being black is the biggest indicator of how harsh a student is going to be disciplined. If your card says black, take two steps forward. If your card says Latino, please take one step forward. Less than a quarter of black and Latinos graduate from high school in four years. If your card says black or Latino, takes two steps forward. In New York State, black youth are more than seven times more likely to be incarcerated than their white peers. Over 80% of youth in the juvenile justice system are males. If your card says black, if your card says black boy, take seven steps forward. Kadiata, can you read what's on that card there in the middle of the room? Present. All right, thank you. That was our opening exercise. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Assemblywoman Diana Richardson, and I proudly represent the communities of Crown Heights, Prospect Leopards, Gardens, and East Flatbush sections of Brooklyn. We have come here today truly to say no to suspensions and yes to solutions. We need to end the school to prison pipeline. We know systemically what has been going on for years, and now today we are going to shed light on this situation and how it disproportionately affects young men and especially young women of color. We just finished a panel next door called Saving Our Children. And if we are really talking about saving our children, we have to take a multi-prong approach. We can no longer stay silent to the things that we know are killing our kids. And look at that exercise. 10 step, two step, five step, straight to prison. Many people are making money off the backs of our youth, yes. Yes, okay? And we have to end that. I am yes. a proud mother of a young 12 year old son who's roaming the hall somewhere, Lord knows, okay? And luckily for him, he has me, right? And so I'm gonna fight him. I, oh, there he goes, that's my son Isaac, yeah. <laughs> So he has me, right? He has me. And so you guys, you can hear my voice is strong, honey. I don't take no for an answer and I'm not going to fight. But not every parent is em empowered the way that I am. And so therefore, we are going to share this information today. And as I said before in other rooms, we got to not only just intake the information, but honey, we got to be action oriented, okay? 
and if we uh, want to truly do something, anything, you got to know the power of the people, the power of the people. People cannot stop us, but we have to stick together and we have to move. And so I want the panel to really give you the information, so I'm going to move myself out the way. And I'm going to turn the mic over to my sister first, because women come before the men. This is my sister, Sunny Woman, Kimberly GPN. My name is Kimberly Jean Pierre. I represent uh, several of Kimberly Jean Pierre. I represent Suffolk County, Long Island, Town, Babylon, which covers areas like White Mansion, Linda Harris, Copay, East Farmingdale, Amityville, and I could go on. But I really want to say to my sister, she's such an energetic woman, and it's so inspirational to have women such as Diana Richardson in the assembly so we can fight for issues like this. So I'm so happy to share to share the table with you. Um, but in, in all note, this panel's discuss how we can end the prison, the pipeline to prison because our children should, co should, should come first. We should provide our quality and a fair education for our children. We shouldn't be discussing a pipeline to, uh, to jail. We should be discussing a pipeline to college. As a mother, you know, my baby can't stand up here because she's only two months. Um, but I just had a two month and as a new parent, you know, I want to know that because um, on Long Island, it's a little different from New York City where we have school districts, and some of those school districts, districts get more resources than others. Right. So I live in a community called Wheatley Heights. Four, down the, four, four blocks down is Wine Ranch. So we have a community where we're talking about pipeline to prison instead of pipeline to college. And in my community, we're talking about pipeline to college, and that's just totally unfair. So I, I sit here in this chamber to represent communities across Long Island, across New York State, where children of color can receive a fair education and where we can talk about college opportunities, vocational opportunities, and not funding prisons. So I want to stand with all of my colleagues, and I know that the panel will be able to give a, 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 a will be able to provide you with information on how we can get together. And most importantly, is to advocate. Show up to your senators, show up to your assembly members, speak out, be vocal in your community, hit that ballot when it's time to vote, because the most important thing is to put people in office that's going to put the pipeline to college and not the pipeline to prison. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So let, let, let me be clear. Uh, for my entire public life of service, I have had a single goal for our children. And that is, each child should have access to an exceptional education yes. in a true public school system that serves the individual needs of the child and the collective good of the community. Yes. Now, I know we're not all going to agree. I have no problem with that. But among the many problematic issues I have identified in the charter school movement <laughs> is extreme disciplinary practices. Amen aptly characterized for me and others as the school to prison pipeline are the most <laughs> distressing. A recent New York Times expose revealed the existence of a quote, got to go list at Success Academy. This story laid bare what parents have been telling us for years. Many charter schools actively encourage parents of children who have deep intense and or special needs to leave charters. Through a Byzantine system of militaristic and arcane rules, the, the, the merits, suspensions, harassment, special classifications, and other totally inflexible and harmful disciplinary procedures, including calling 911 on students. The Times story was heartbreaking because it demonstrated with absolute clarity the modus operandi of Success Academy. Single out and dispose of any child who may cause a problem. Single out and dispose of any child. No matter if the problem is that they need to go to the bathroom or find it difficult to maintain perfect posture. Should they not knuckle under to these rules, it's time for them to go. This type of conduct is unconscionable. Instead of proving and enriching supportive and learning environment, charter schools reject children who do not fit their mold. 
sending them spiraling at a time when they are most vulnerable. Years from now, these same students, who are almost 100% young people of color, will be standing in line with their heads down and spirits broken in the bowels of a correctional facility, God forbid, with the power dynamics and disciplinary procedures are the same. There is a better path forward. Charter schools cannot be allowed to arbitrarily impose wide-ranging and discriminatory disciplinary standards on our children. At the very least, they must have the same standardized procedures that involve due process and fairness as true public school. Frankly, no charter school should get another dime from, the, from you and the taxpaying public until they reform the school to pipeline system. Thank you very much. I, I, I tried to provide you uh, with a copy of, of what I just shared. Uh, and if you have any questions, comments, concerns, if not today, you can always reach me uh, in, uh, in Harlem at the state office. Here. I'd like to once again thank Assemblymember Richardson, John Pierre. I think uh, what Assemblymember Richardson said in the beginning of her remarks is really important for us to think through is that oftentimes when we talk about the school to prison pipeline, black women are forgotten and made invisible and the impact on them and the trauma on them is made invisible. That's why you see the young women, right? You see the panel that we have here today. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Senator Perkins for his words as well. Uh, we're going to let the panel introduce themselves. I want to just briefly, because they were so gracious to join us for that opening exercise, acknowledge Rockaway Youth Task Force, which is another youth-led organization from New York City working on a lot of the same issues as us. We will start down here and then work our way down. My name is Caitlin Banner. I'm an attorney at an organization called Advancer Project, and we're a racial justice organization out of Washington, D.C. that works to support um, communities of color who are working, particularly for me, around the school to prison pipeline and stopping those policies. So we've been working real closely with a lot of folks um, here on the panel today to think about how we can change New York State law to make sure that these policies are not affecting our young people or not impacting our young people's ability to, to succeed in school. So I'm just real excited to be here today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tyler Brewster, and I'm a New York City public school educator. I'm currently the restorative practices coordinator at a transfer high school um, by the name of the James Baldwin School in Chelsea, Manhattan. I'm also a member of Teachers Unite, which is a member-led organization of public school educators working to change school climate and implement restorative practices properly throughout the New York City public school system. So and I'm very, very excited to be here today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Melanie Funches, and I'm a parent from Rochester, New York, the other Ooh. part of the state over there by Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Upstate. <laughs> and I am a, I'm a parent, but I'm also a mental health advocate. And my daughter was de was impacted by some of the practices we're going to talk about today that tried to move her from an Ivy League contender to prison. Mm. Good afternoon. My name is Kariyata Kaba. Um, I'm, from, I'm a youth leader at Make the Road New York in Urban Youth Collaborative, and I'm a senior at the High School for Public Service in Brooklyn, New York. Hello, my name is Araceli Quintero. I'm a junior at Bush School for Social Justice, and I'm also a part of Make the Road New York. Hi, my name is Janae Tucker. I represent Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice and Urban Youth Collaborative, and I attend DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx. So we started by the, we started the, this afternoon by doing an exercise where we read off some statistics. Kadiata, could you help us all a little bit more understand what is the school to prison pipeline? Sure. Okay. So the school to, uh, the school to prison pipeline is. Zero, to zero tolerance policies that has been brought in to cover acts of non-compliance, defiance, and disrespect. And it is used to push out black and brown students, and as we know, they will end up in prison. So, so to drill down on that a little bit more, think about what that looks like. And again, we're talking from a perspective of folks that go to schools in New York City, right? So in New York City, we have 5,400 school safety agents that work for the NYPD and 3,600 combined guidance counselors and social workers throughout the school, right? So there's more than, there's a thousand more police officers in our schools than guidance counselors and social workers, right? 
what are some of the things that police officers may give 16-year-olds a criminal summons form in New York City school? You can get a criminal summons for being disorderly, obscene gesture. You can get a criminal summons for being disorderly by being excessively loud in a school. You can get a disorderly conduct criminal summons for not obeying the lawful authority of someone in the school, right? These are all discipline issues which have traditionally been handled by administrators and educators in schools, which are now under the control of police in our schools, right? When Kadiata talks about zero tolerance policies and what does it look like and she says defiance, the overwhelming majority of suspensions in schools, not just in New York City, but throughout the country, when we talk about preschoolers being suspended, these are not for violent incidents, right? Our schools are safer than they've ever been in the last 20 years. The reasons that students are being suspended for are overwhelmingly subjective infractions such as insubordinate or willfully defiant, right? And when we say subjective infractions, those of us that live in black and Latino communities should think about why can you be pulled over for stop and frisk, right? A police officer can stop, question, and frisk you because they say you were acting in a certain way, which is totally up to their discretion and is a subjective issue, right? So those same issues that are plaguing us in our communities have followed our young people into our schools, right? We want to um, give some time to let some of the young people share some of the experiences they've had and also talk with some of our folks over here about what it is that we're trying to do, what role educators are playing, and uh, what role parents are playing as well. I want to uh, start um, by letting Araceli um, share with us a story she had with a long-term suspension last year. Hi again. Um, well, two months ago, well, three months ago, in my sophomore year, I was suspended for two months because I was trying to help a teacher help stop a fight. And eventually, they included me into this fight, where then I was sent to an alternative high school, which was John Jay. And I didn't go because the work that they gave me wasn't the one that I, wasn't the work that I could get. And also because every time I went, there was also, there was always some kind of problem that stopped the class, so I found it pointless. Um, like during this time, it was difficult for me because I'm also a foster child. And uh, everything was happening around the same time, during the same months, and it was, uh, my school was pushing me out, my home, like I was kicked out. And it was difficult for me because I had nowhere, no open doors to go to. Um, eventually, you know, I went back to school and it was hard because I had to catch up with all the work and my regions, I missed regions prep, so I had failed my regions during that year. Um, so, um, so I wanna... Excuse me, before we go any further, can we please request that all the panelists speak directly into the microphone? Okay. When the door opens, you can't hear. Can't hear. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I want to pull out a couple of things Araceli mentioned. So Araceli was in an incident at her school where there was a fight. Um, she received, she was suspended from school for two months. Two months she was suspended from school for being a part of this incident. One of the provisions in the bill that we've just introduced here in Albany would limit suspensions to no more than 20 days. As we talk with young people, it, it's still a long time. What you said, what happened to seven days? Because that's when it was when you were in school? Yeah. Um, but another thing that, if you heard she mentioned in her story was, at the time she was also, she had also become a foster child, right? And the alternative school they sent her to wasn't even providing her with the school work she needed for her home school. So when she got back to her home school, how was she, how was she expected to pass the regents? if she got totally different curriculum over two months, right? So another provision in the bill would actually require throughout New York State that if students are removed from schools, it requires the schools to provide students with their curriculum. So when they come back to school, they have the curriculum that their classmates were working on, because we know that's not happening for too many students. Araceli, could you talk a little bit about what you think the school, how the school could have handled that differently? 
talk, talk loud and <laughs> the mic. What I feel the school could have done differently was individually spoken to us and actually resolved the problem instead of pushing us out for so long. Yeah. I'm going to ask uh, our educator on the panel to talk. One of the solutions that the bill encourages schools to begin using is restorative justice. And I'm going to ask Tyler to help kind of explain to everyone who may not be familiar with the term what restorative justice is and, and how does that look in practice in a school. Sure. So. There are a lot of misconceptions about restorative justice, and there's this top-down idea that it's um, a program or a philosophy that you can just kind of put into a school, open a book, do some lessons, and now all of a sudden you're doing restorative justice. That's false. What it actually is, is it's an approach that brings the entire community together. So parents, students, teachers, custodians, school safety agents, if you work in a school and you have an investment in that school community, you are involved in the process. And we use this process to address harms in a um, more humane and meaningful way. So. Traditionally, um, schools rely on punitive models. Something goes wrong, there was some kind of wrongdoing, we push the offender out of the space, and we, there's a lot of attention that's put on, on the victim. Restorative justice doesn't use those terms. I like to think of it more as the responsible party and the harmed party, and because it, it decriminalizes this, the situation. Instead of blaming a student for um, negative behavior, it really looks at the root cause of it. No, I've been an educator for 10 years, and in my experience, before doing restorative justice, I was a dean of student discipline. And even in that work, there was no one student that woke up and decided today was going to be the day that I turn up for no reason. There are usually other things going on, um, unmet needs that manifest themselves in negative behavior. So what we really need to be doing is focusing on this student and helping them correct this behavior versus pushing them out of our community. So restorative justice brings them back in and asks the question of not only what did you do, but what led up to you making this decision? How did you arrive um, at this place where you thought that this was okay? And pulling them closer and having a communication that validates their perspective and their experiences in life. And so there's three t uh, major tiers to restorative justice, and the first and most important is community building. In order to repair anything or w be willing to restore anything, I have to feel that I'm a respected and valued member of that community. And so restorative justice gives the space for those um, kind of initiatives to take place. And then there's also space for harm and healing and re-entry. So when something does go wrong to our community, we can rely on these um, practices and the, the community building we did in the first place to figure out, well, how can we take <laughs> steps to develop a pathway to repair? One thing I do want to say is that there's a, another misconception that this is, um, this is just discipline focused. It's largely proactive and preventative in nature. And I also want to make clear that this is not a recipe for fixing black and brown students. They are not broken. It's our system and our society that's broken. So what restorative justice does, it brings these issues to the forefront. And it forces us to address it. It forces us to address the disparities in school discipline. It forces us to, to discuss the, the racial issues and racial injustices that are going on in our society, like this big elephant in the room, and we keep acting like we can interact on a very personal level without addressing those issues. So restorative justice gives space for all perspectives to be analyzed and validated. And um, compared to what I used to do as a dean of student discipline, um, this is way more rewarding. It's, I will say it's uh, much more time that's involved, much more energy. But in the long run, I can see the effect that it's having on students because it tells them, like, okay, I admit, I see you went wrong, but I'm going to show you how to fix it versus I'm blaming you for it. Yeah. Right. So I want I want to bring us back to the system that Tyler mentioned, right? So there's 5,400 police officers in New York City schools, which is a thousand more police officers than Tyler's, right? That's a thousand more people that do that job that criminalize students than Tyler's job. New York City annually spends 400 million dollars a year. $400 million of the Department of Education's budget goes to the NYPD to put police officers in schools. We spend $13 million right now on restorative practices. So we are throwing criminal justice responses at our children, right? I want to come back to our panel again and ask Janae to actually share an experience um, that just happened to her just this week. This past Wednesday, when I returned to school, I was in a layman class, also known as ELA. I had a migraine, so I decided to put my head down for five to 10 minutes. Usually teachers would come to a student, ask if you're okay or if you want water. Unfortunately, my teacher started yelling out my name to leave the class if I wasn't paying attention. I didn't say nothing, I couldn't, I had a headache. My table peer told her I had my eyes open and I was listening to her. She continued to yell, no excuses, go to the office, and call the hallway assistant to remove me. I looked at her and I asked, why must I leave? 
for having a headache. I'm taking my notes and I'm also listening, so why should I, show, should I leave? She continued to yell because you have your head down. Many were asked, why didn't you go to the nurse? I'm not registered, so they told me to return to class, so I just put my head down for a few. I was highly upset. I called my parents and I told them I was coming home. The next day I returned and tried to participate. The reason why I said try is because every time I raised my hand, she would look at me and ignore me and put my, participating, my participation grade as a zero. During the workshop, me and my group peers was talking about the worksheet and at the end she told me to leave the class for the peers to stay after. I left and my peer told me that she said that I was distracting them and from their work by talking. I got upset again and I told my principal and I confronted to him that my teacher was being very unprofessional and disrespectful for an adult to a child. The next day I, respect, I returned and I was not even allowed to step foot into the class. I was told by my AP due to what I said the past day, I was not allowed in class until further notice. I sat in the office with a piece of paper with no direct directions. This was unacceptable for me. I checked my pupil path grades. I passed every single class above 80 average for the past two weeks except for enlightenment with a 62. I was furious to go on break knowing that three days after a student having her head down had minor cause to a huge downgrade. Janae, I want to ask if you think that um, black girls in schools are treated differently than you think a white girl would be treated in a school. Black girls will be treated differently because many teachers do preserve us as disrespectful, loud, or ghetto, and we people don't have those same vices for white girls. I want to um, transition to Melanie as a parent and mental health advocate and someone who's expressed um, having some of those same issues of how her daughter was being perceived and, and treated um, by her school. One, you know, as a mental health advocate and as a parent, maybe share with us why are you involved in this work? A lot of times there's a perception that, um, you know, this, there's a coalition of young folks and other folks fighting for it, but it's important to know that there are parents throughout the state also fighting for these changes as well. Well, I was, I've been fighting for, with parents and for equity among parents before I ever had children. So I do this because every child is mine. I do this because as a mental health, can y'all hear me? I do this because as a mental health advocate, I understand that adolescent brains do not become fully developed until about age 25, and the things that they are being punished for, they're being punished for being adolescents. They are being punished for behaviors that are uh, developmentally appropriate for their age. I do this because when this happened to my child, and just really quickly, my daughter um, is in 11th grade this year. When she was in 10th grade, uh, my daughter, wait, let me go back. When my daughter was in 9th grade, my daughter went into 9th grade with five credits. She was technically a sophomore entering 9th grade. She had um, a, about a 92 average, a high honor roll, just a great student. She, just, she said her aspiration is to be a neuroscientist. She had, her, her dream school at the time was Cornell. At this point, she had visited Cornell three times, made connections with admissions. Oh yeah, she the bomb. All right, I, I own her. I, that, she does that, that's her. She entered the school, her school, now I wanna, I'm talking, we talk about suspensions, but I wanna talk about also another piece of the school to prison pipeline. The thing of low, the, the thing of low expectations. My daughter went in and she was told that the first meeting she needs to have is with her counselor to make sure that the courses she is taking through her high school will align her to be well suited to apply to Cornell. So she goes to the counselor and the counselor, the counselor is putting her into the lower level courses and she's saying, no, I don't need those courses. I already took that, I already took that. I'm going to be a neuroscientist. And the counselor turns to her and says, isn't that a little big for you? And says, well, maybe you should go to MCC, which is Monroe Community College. Now, I, and when I say this, sometimes people think I'm putting, I'm putting shade on community college. I am not in any way. But she already had a plan. And they moved her plan. So this, this is how she started her high school career. So she had been going through, my daughter is an adolescent, and she has a cell phone, as many adolescents do. She was using her cell phone, and she and she said that she didn't get to put her. She they had asked her to put it away. She didn't put it away quick enough, and they had confiscated her phone on a Monday. The way for her to get her phone back was to come to Saturday detention. During this Saturday detention, for three hours from nine to noon, you go into a room and you're not allowed to leave for any reason. My daughter is a girl. My daughter had on white pants. My daughter needed to use the bathroom. I'm trying to be as 
as I can be. They told her she could not use the bathroom, but that she could go see the administrator. So she has to go see the administrator. And where did she go? On the way back out to the bathroom, she was told she saw the administrator. The administrator said, well, you know, you just lost it. You're out for, um, for uh, five days. It, it gets better. So she was like, so she said, well, since I'm going to be out of school for five days, now remember, this is for a cell phone. When, since I'm going to be out of school, can I have my phone back? You know, it's reasonable. So he says, yeah, she thinks that the phone is in his office. So when he turns to walk to his office, she follows him. He turns around to her and says, what you doing? And puts his hand in her face like this. She goes to move his hand from her face and he files charges. I have to pay bail for my honor roll student. My daughter, and, and I have on, on tape my daughter saying, they are stealing my dreams. Absolutely. They are robbing me. Absolutely. She says, I'm going in to be a neuroscience. All they see me is, la is as lashes and bundles. Wow. The reason our girls, our girls, because our girls are strong, because our girls are magic, because our girls are powerful, and they do not articulate in the way that are typical for dominant culture, our girls are seen as a threat. And as a mental health advocate who understands this, not just from, you know, my daily practice of it, but from a theoretical standpoint, I know that this, this, impacts our girls and it impacts our girls differently because the way our girls receive information than the way that is different from our boys. Yes. Our girls, this hurts our girls in their hearts in a way that they do not recover. They, we look good, but we do not recover internally the same way. Exactly. Is that, what, did I answer your question? I think so. Okay. Yes. Um, so this bill that we are working on that we've introduced, this is not about, right, I mean, we've seen Bill O'Reilly talking about what school discipline in, in black schools look like. As Tyler explained, this is not about letting anyone get away with anything, right? Like, this is about protecting the rights of our children from a system that we know is doing what she just explained, right? Their stories are not anomalies. They're not isolated incidents. We could have brought thousands of students up with us today from New York, from Wine Dance, from Syracuse, from Rochester, from all over the state that would share stories just like that, right? So I wanna um, transition to Caitlin. If you can help touch on like some of the things that this bill will do in order to protect the rights of students in schools. Yeah, so can everyone hear me with this mic? Yes. Cool. Um, so, so we've introduced this bill, right? A coalition of folks from around New York State, from the city, from Syracuse, from Buffalo, from Rochester, from Westchester, um, and other places that are joining in to say that we cannot have the system of suspensions and expulsions and exclusionary discipline that is eating our students up, right? This is not a system that is working. And we know there are um, years of, re of research, decades of research that tells us that suspensions do not make schools safer, that suspensions do not um, increase the success rate for anybody in the school. So sometimes there's this myth, right, that we've got to get the bad kids out so the good kids can learn. That doesn't hold true. When you look at the numbers, schools that have lower rates of suspension, overall, everybody succeeds better. Everyone does better. The test scores are better, teachers are happier, students are happier, parents are happier. So we know that these suspension practices are not working and that the negative effects of them, right, are falling most heavily on our students of color. So we need to fix these policies. Um, so this bill that we've introduced, right, there, it's trying to do two things. It's trying to limit and shrink the number of suspensions and expulsions. So, so number one priority, we need many, many less suspensions and expulsions in this, in this state. Right now, over 500 students are suspended per day across the state. It's a huge number. And so we need to, so the bill does things like make sure that students cannot be suspended for things like these insubordinations, these minor offenses, this disrespect, right? We know that there have to be ways of responding to that, that we need to have our, um, our teachers and other adults trained on how to manage classrooms, how to, how to uh, address behavior. But we also know that young people are doing things that are adolescently appropriate, that are developmentally appropriate, and that it's the adults whose behavior needs to change and not the students, right? So this bill puts in place these things that would limit the numbers of suspensions. It also gets rid of suspensions for our babies, right? So right now, you can be suspended at any age throughout the state of New York. This bill says kindergarten through third grade, suspension is off the table. 
and you heard Casey talk at the beginning, right, that um, these disparities in school discipline, they start early, they start in preschool. So we know from the federal government who collects this data every year, that our suspensions, um, disparities in sus suspensions start as early as pre-K. So this bill just says, nope, we're not gonna have it. Kindergarten through third grade, we're just not gonna kick them out of school. Um, the other thing that this bill does that's really important is that it says that when we do do suspensions, which is hopefully gonna be a much, much smaller number, we're gonna do them in the way that is the least harmful, right? So they're still probably not the best thing that we can be doing, but we know that we, we can't get rid of them completely yet, we're working on it, and if you wanna join the campaign, and if you think this stuff isn't going far enough, we encourage you to join up, but we know that we wanna, for the suspensions that are gonna happen, we wanna make sure they're the least harmful possible. So like we said, that means that we're gonna have better due process rights, right? We're gonna have opportunities for students and parents to challenge suspensions, to, um, to get the evidence to know what's going on and to really uh, make sure that they understand what's happening and that they can fight back. Um, we wanna make sure that those suspensions don't last for longer than 20 days. Um, and that's for the most serious offenses, right? So we're not talking that every suspension should be 20 days. Most of our suspensions are five days and under, but we should be capping them at 20 days. Right now, um, they are, I think they're capped at 60, or is it? 90. 90, thank you, 90. It's um, not capped at 90, it's six to 180 days. Six to 180 days. So we wanna cap that at six to 20 days for our most serious offenses, right? And then we, we also wanna make sure that um, the bill puts in place things in schools other than suspension and expulsion. So right now you have no options, right? The only options are when, when there's something going on is to kick a student out of school, to deny them of their education. And we know that the bill needs to put into place and, and does put into place um, alternatives like restorative justice, like Tyler was talking about, um, puts into place um, uh, more supports for counselors, more supports for um, social workers and other support personnel um, to make sure that when students are having real issues in school that we can address those, right? That there are people in place that are not police officers, that are not just deans of discipline, but that are people who are trained, who have specialized expertise in helping to students and parents and communities to work through those issues. And so um, this bill does kind of a combination of all those things. I don't know if there's more, I'm happy to answer questions both from the audience or others on the panel about more specifics, but we're really excited about this bill. I think it's groundbreaking. Um, there are states that are starting to do this around the country. California's passed laws recently, Illinois has passed laws, Colorado's passed laws to change what's happening. And this would affect, right, this would, this would affect all of the districts in New York State, including our charter schools, to make sure that everyone's on a level plane. Thank you. I want to uh, transition to Tyler and, and ask Tyler two questions. So it'll be one question and it'll be a follow-up. Um, the first question being, and I, I think we heard um, Janae and Melanie touch on this as well, but as an educator, as someone who's been working in schools for 10 years, from your point of view, how do you, what role do you think race plays in the way uh, <laughs> discipline is approached in black and Latino communities and schools? Well, we could start by just looking at the statistics we talked about earlier. Um, there are glaring disparities about the use of punitive discipline models in school. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Sorry particularly in schools attended by largely black and brown um, student populations. And so black students um, are more are suspended at a higher rate, particularly black young women are suspended at a much higher rate than all other races, and including most boys. Um, black students nationally maybe make up 16% of the population, but they're accounting for up to almost 42% of suspensions and expulsions. So that right there is showing us what role race is playing in this. And it would be very easy to, you know, to lend yourself to the idea that, oh, it's, it's the students and their behavior and they're responsible and they need to change. But again, it's going back to our systems are the ones that are broken. And it's really the lens through which we see these young people that need to be shifted. And working with um, other educators, it's a choice. Whenever you discipline a student, it is absolutely a choice. Yes, there's a blue book with the chances, regulations, and such, but you have options in terms of what methods or what interventions are you going to use for the student. Even looking at the chancellor's regs, most infractions don't start at a principal suspension for um, addressing it. There's parent conferences, there's, circ there's restorative language in um, the discipline code now, there's peer mediation. But most often, deans will just jump right down to that principal suspension option or that superintendent suspension option. And that says more about, I think, the adult in the situation than the young person. And what we're saying, there's a lot of assumptions that are coming um, to the table through adults. There's implicit bias. We each have personal experiences that we bring to work with us each and every day, yet we act as though you can turn off the human part of your brain when you enter a classroom. And that's absolutely false. So we need to create spaces 
to train teachers to deal with students in ways that look at them as a whole student and not just looking at this one action, but what are, the, what are all the experiences and instances that made up this student and how can I help you move forward versus just assuming um, negative attentions from bad behavior. So I'm going to uh, actually ask Kadiata to share a statistic with us because we are, we're talking about suspensions because suspensions are important. Right? One suspension doubles the likelihood that a student is going to drop out of high school. Students that drop out of high school are eight times more likely to, be, uh, to find themselves in prison. Right? Um, even if you are suspending a student, right? if you're removing a student from that school community, and I'm going to open it up, what, where do they go? What community do they go back to? Our community. They, they live in our community, right? So you're removing them from the school for 30 days. They, they're still our brothers and sisters, right? They still live in our community. I want to talk, I want Kariata to really quickly share uh, the statistic. Um, again, this is for New York City. I can share a national statistic around this, but because um, we've been talking about suspension so much, but there are many arrests that happen in our schools for non-criminal violations. Can you? Quickly share Kadi the statistics around arrest in New York City. Arrest? Yeah. I think it's the 94. Oh, yeah. White? Oh. Okay. Black and Latino students account for 94% of all students that are arrested in New York City. New York, 94%. Black and Latino students make up 69% of our student population. New York City, we're from the city. 69% of our population in New York City, they make up 94% of arrests in New York City. If you are not in New York City, do you think your numbers are any different than that? I wanna um, transition back to Tyler again to talk about what are some of the alternatives that need to be invested in and, and how does that change relationships at schools? So Tyler, if you could share with us now that you've been doing the restorative work in your school, how have you seen that change relationships between teachers and students, between students and students, between teachers and teachers? It changes the tone of the school entirely. And um, I think school climate is based on the interpersonal relationships that are built on any given day within a school building. And so what restorative practices seek to do is instead of like playing this blame shame game, like you're responsible, you did this, so now you have to leave, it seeks to find a path for understanding. And when I say understanding, mutual understanding, and not just this idea of the student has to understand what they did wrong and how they can reflect and make it better. No, the teacher also needs to reflect because sometimes we make mistakes. Um, when we make our rules, where where is this definition of power coming from and what does a rule mean and what does it represent? And what does it represent when it's broken? And getting teachers to really think about that um, when they're developing their classroom management plans and developing um, ways to interact with students on a daily basis. And so this idea of reflection, it's not just for the young people. We as adults need to reflect. Our society is punitive in nature, right? Like you run a red light, you get a ticket. You have poor performance at work, you get fired. You commit a crime, you go to jail. So trying to create this, um, I guess, a, a different way of looking at discipline in schools is difficult because it's asking some teachers to relinquish their authority and their power. And they're going into the classroom relying on that as their tool for education versus um, moving with their minds and their hearts and figure out how can I connect to you as a person. And so restorative practices give space for conversations to happen. I think it improves accountability. I find students are way more responsible. I see students peer mediating without even coming to my office and they'll say, you know what, miss, if I was at my old school, I would have done X, Y, and Z differently. So we can't keep blaming students when they don't reach um, our, I guess, our expectations. We have to show them different ways to handle conflicts. And unless we're gonna give them those tools, we can't shun them and push them out of our community and expect on this five day suspension, I guess you're gonna watch a YouTube video and figure out like how to come back and be a part of this community. The only way to be a part of a community and to learn to be a member of that community is to be in that community. And restorative practices, it does exactly that. Yeah, you messed up, but you still have a role here. And until you start to pull your weight, I want you to see how it's affecting all of us. It tells students, it tells teachers, it tells parents that you matter. Your voice matters. And I think that is huge for um, shifting school culture. Thank you. Um, so I, we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, we will open up the rest of the panel for any questions from folks. So um, just speaking as a victim of someone who's been through the school to prison pipeline, tracked into special education, dropped out after being left, left back uh, for the third time, eventually going into prison, spending a decade in prison, earning my GED in prison, going to college in prison, 
earning my master's after my release, now getting my PhD. I say that just to say that you all pushing. You all pushing. I wanted to hear about this gun-free school school zone act. Are you familiar with that? The federal government. Uh, it was actually a bill that was introduced uh, by by our current um, vice president Joe Biden in 1990. The gun-free school zone act, which said any student who was found in possession of a gun within a thousand feet of a school would be uh, expelled for no less than one year. This eventually morphed to a perception of a weapon being determined by the administration of that particular school. So it morphed to where a weapon is no longer considered just a gun. It could be a knife, it could be a bat, it could be a chain, it could be any type of perceived threat. And we know historically that the black bodies, black boys particularly, have always come with a preconceived notion of them being inherently criminal or a threat. All the way from Emmett Till's reckless eyeballing Right? Until you look at the statistics on death penalty and any type of white victim involved. Right? And we look at the proportion of teachers who are who are teaching our black babies and overwhelmingly white women. So we're talking about cultural competency, having the ability to create a connection with the a, a community based on the idea that you understand the culture that you're working with. Like how can you create a community without understanding the culture of the people that you're serving? Right? So I'm just here to say and reiterate what everyone said that listen, it's a must that we incorporate restorative practices. Restorative practices also have their origin in our indigenous ancestors. This is not something new. You know, as an academic, this is not something that just came out of textbooks and white scholars said we're gonna develop a practice in order to restore the community. This is something that's inherent in our genes and our community and our culture. So restorative practice is a must. We have to figure out ways to one. Make sure that the teachers who are working with our young people have the humility and have the compassion needed to understand their culture, and furthermore, to establish this community that will allow our young people to feel a part of it in the first place, because they don't feel like that's a community that embraces them. So thank you. I'm gonna share a quick stat because, again, let's, he talked about the Gun Free School Zone Act, right? With that came an expansion that Kadiaka talked about, an expansion of zero, zero tolerance in schools, right? Where it's not just a gun now, it's any kind of weapon, right? It's not just talking back, it's just subordination, right? That expanded out to zero tolerance throughout our schools. And so when we're talking about reforming school discipline, reforming uh, the way we approach school discipline, it is reforming criminal justice, right? There was a youth justice panel earlier. Young people are literally being pulled out of their classroom and in the prison. We saw it in South Carolina. Right? That young girl has to go to court in March for being thrown across the room by a police officer. Really quick, before I let Melanie come in and come back here. So speaking of criminal justice, black students represent 16% of all students in the country, 27% of all students referred to law enforcement, 31% of all students subjected to school rated arrest. Still about hundreds of thousands of students across the country. Melanie wanted to say something, and then we're gonna go in the <coughs> queue here, and then I see someone in the back in here. And here, someone help me keep the queue, thank you. I just wanted to say, uh, my brother, thank you for sharing, and I wanted to say, and I want to appreciate you for standing tall to, say, to let help other brothers and help other folk know that we can make it through. But what I want to say is that while we're, because we talk about the restorative practice and we talk about these things, but I also want to put forth into the universe that we need to have training on implicit bias for everyone who works in a school. Because if you cannot understand my oppression, if you cannot understand my suffering and my pain, you cannot understand my evil. So you need to, we need to make sure that the people who are working, I, I work as fast as I can to bring people into the pipeline to become mental health advocates, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, teachers, but I can't do it. So the people who are here have to understand that they have a bias. Mm -hmm. And the only way is, it, is if we teach them. So while we're doing these things, I also want to put it to the universe that we start training all staff who work with our kids about implicit bias, because that is at the root of what is being done to our children. My question is, is that one of the things you put a lot of focus on the children, mm -hmm. but I don't see you saying anything in reference to the parents. Yeah. Because, you know, in order for the school and them to do things, the parents need to know what's going on, but they do not know what's going on. You can't school my child if you're a teacher. That is my job. 
you know, not your job. You're supposed to tell me if my child is doing something wrong. Right. And if, how am I supposed to know if you're not giving me the rules and regulation? I am from District 19. Mm -hmm. I grew up in District 19. I was a PTA president there. And in the school city, in city schools, they do not give the information to the parents enough. So I'm a. I'm, yeah, go I agree 100% with yeah. what you're saying, which is why at my school I start with the PTA. And I, you're absolutely right. When we're looking at like stakeholders in terms of the New York City public school system, parents and students are the largest stakeholder group over teachers, counselors, school safety agents, you name it. So I do agree that there's a level of education in um, bringing parents into the space and educating them about these practices. I agree 100%, which is why Teachers Unite, we try to work with um, DC 37 so that we can get out to the parent unions within um, different school districts so that they can be educated and pushed. Because the, the cities where we see the most success is because the parents and the students, and it was very grassroots from the ground up, and it's not coming from administration top down. So I agree with you 100%. And, and I would just say really quickly in terms of the bill that we are working on, the provisions in the bill requires school districts to work with parents and community members in building a school discipline code. And if you have police in your district right now, in building a memorandum of understanding between police and schools and communities. So the part of the bill would require school districts to show that they have multiple stakeholders at the table when they are building their school discipline policies. So the bill does, first of all, limits that suspensions are off the table for those minor things. So for things like disrespect, insubordination, disorderly conduct, right, suspension is off the table. It's not an option. So that six to 20 days, those are for your most serious things, right? So those are things um, when there when there's real incidents of violence, when there's real incidents of safety to the school community, that there, that somebody needs to be removed for a, for a, a period of time, and then that removal is coupled with not only getting work and getting appropriate curriculum and access to tests, but also to supportive services. So um, so the bill does cut down suspensions for those minor behaviors that that we were talking about throughout the panel today, as well as make sure that when we are using suspension, that we're using the best practices around it that we know. Um, we, we, we agree with you, six to 20 days is still a long time and, and our bill is written in a way that we hope that those are a very, very small percentage of people and a very, very small sus a percentage of the suspensions that we see. And we, want, we know that we're gonna need to work if this bill gets passed, when this bill gets passed, we're gonna need to work in our communities and in our school districts to make sure that the codes of conduct are being written so that those six to 20 days are not being used um, really ever. So, and, and I think that we need to make sure, right, that, um, that the legislators, that your legislators understand the importance of this bill. So reach out to your representatives, tell them that this is a critical issue. Tell them that, um, that the way to make our schools safer, the way to make our schools more productive, to make them more successful, to, so that all of our students are on that path to graduation, to college, to what they want to do to be successful in life, is to limit suspensions to stop this exclusionary discipline. So that's what I'm asking everyone in this room to do. The pipeline is much more than just suspensions and arrests in schools, right? It is about what are we teaching our children. It's about the type of schools our children are showing up to, whether they're crumbling, right? It's about all these things that intersect with each other, and then what are we doing as a whole? And so we are here today specifically talking about a bill we are working on in a coalition of folks. We address these multiple issues back in New York City, right? Like you can't talk about suspensions if students don't have counselors in their schools, right? If they don't have nurses like students in Philadelphia don't have. So there are youth organizations, parent organizations working on all these issues as a whole with the limited number of time that we have today. We're talking about the issues as related to this. If folks would like to hear about what's some more of the work that we are doing in New York, and or see if we know organizations in your communities that are doing some of this work, we would be more than happy to share that with you afterwards. We understand there are campaigns for curriculum going on in multiple places, there are campaigns to bring more black teachers into schools, and so we know all these things have to be tacked at multiple angles. We are specifically just talking about what we're working on up here with some legislators. With it, there are more questions. I I want to know what type of training, if any, are teachers and school staff getting to deal with students with mental health issues instead of suspending them and kicking them out of school? What what training. type of training are they getting to deal with these children? What type of training? Um, in the back. Uh, could you talk about the white female teacher and the black and the brown student dynamic? I can. Yes. And mine is about training too. In this bill, is implicit bias training for staff and admin, uh, specifically in the bill. Got it. So, Ty, thank you.
So there is a larger movement around um, teacher training, specifically to what you were speaking about. So de-escalation training um, with school safety agents. There is um, more focus on special education and bringing it out. Instead of just maybe special services teachers being trained in that aspect, other teachers from other, like ELA or math or other, um, I guess, specialty areas are being trained in practices and dealing with students with, with special education. So we are trying to expand it. My organization, I can speak to, for example, Teachers Unite, we do free, tra because the problem is funding, right? Like that's the first thing, who's paying for this? Where's this money coming from? So the organization I work with, we do free training. We'll go into schools, um, meet with administration, meet with teachers, figure out what the needs are and develop a, like a, I guess a, a path for the year to figure out how can we meet these needs of all students. Because you're right, the, the IEP po student population is largely affected by a lot of these practices. So there definitely is a need for more training. We, we started, I guess, on a smaller level with free training. That's the perspective that I can speak from. So but there, we do have a ways to go, I agree. So for the question in the back around the, the dynamic between many of our teachers, most of the teachers in schools are white, white women. Most of the students in these schools are black and Latino <laughs> children. Uh, just really quickly, right, so there's some research that recently just came out that showed, and there has to be more correlations, but the early cor correlations in the research was that a student who has a teacher of another race, and in this research, which was done, I believe, uh, University of Kentucky, a, a white teacher, if it's a black student, a black male student, or a black girl student, they are more likely to be out of school for more days, and those reasons were chronic absenteeism and suspensions, right? On the flip side, there's much research that says students that have teachers that look like them actually really thrive in those schools. And then Caitlin's gonna answer in 10 seconds. Yeah, so um, on, the, on the training requirement, the bill has says that there has to be training and offers a number of different suggested types of training. It doesn't explicitly require implicit bias training, but that's one of the options, one of the things that's listed, because we know that districts do need some ability to look at their their needs and say right there's a lot of different districts across the state and so to figure out what training is going to be the most helpful for their for their their staff right so so but it is listed explicitly as one of the options the bill that we are working on actually would cover charter schools as well and so this is asking for equity and discipline throughout the system i want to thank our great panel for joining us